It is 5 p.m. in Jakarta. It is 1 p.m. in Kampala. I'm Monita Rajpal. This is World One, live from London. But first, Umar Patek has admitted to a court in Indonesia that he helped make explosives for terrorist terror attacks that left more than 200 people dead. Right now, he is learning his fate. Judges are reading a verdict that runs to 270 pages. Patek is charged for his role in the 2002 Bali nightclub bombing. The time as well. The Bali bombings were called the worst acts of terrorism in Indonesia's history. They happened in October 2002 when two bombs exploded in the popular nightclub district of Kuta. They went off almost simultaneously in two separate bars, killing 202 people mostly Western tourists. Hughes was badly wounded by one of those bombs and he spent two and a half weeks on life support after suffering uh, dreadful burns, lapsing into a coma and almost dying three times. Hughes gave evidence at uh, Umar Patek's trial five weeks ago. He joins us now live from Perth, Western Australia. Peter, thank you very much for being with us. What's going through your mind as we all wait to hear this verdict? Uh, I think it's just, um bit of anxiety in terms of all right, uh, we have to interrupt there. I do apologize for the uh, the sound quality there. We are obviously experiencing some uh, technical difficulties there over Skype, but we will try and get uh, Peter back and bring that uh, to you when we do. Now, let's move on. And uh, another story that we're following here on CNN, authorities in Australia are telling CNN a ship with up to 200 people on board has uh, overturned in the Indian Ocean. The vessel capsized 200 kilometers northwest of Christmas Island. Julian that Assange is Hold up inside a foreign embassy in London while outside police are waiting to arrest him. In just a few hours from now, the founder of the WikiLeaks website should find out whether Ecuador will offer him an escape route. He has asked for asylum there and Ecuador's deputy foreign minister told an Australian broadcaster a decision would be made today. That in Britain in 2010, after a request from Sweden to question him over allegations of rape, his bail conditions require him to spend every night an address at an address near London, the home of a wealthy supporter. Nem Albagir is outside the Ecuadorian embassy. She joins us now with more on this, uh, I would assume, a very anxious wait, Nema. Well, well, and, and the, the diplomatic waters. waters have just gotten muddier, Manita. See, we want to see what newspapers uh, are saying about this here in Britain, the headline in The Independent. Why do we buy into this one-man psychodrama? It's a commentary that goes on to say Assange has used his hacking skills to turn himself into a worldwide phenomenon, and now he demands for himself exactly the same impunity he exoriates in politicians. In Assange's uh, home country, the headline in The Australian is Assange's asylum bid is baseless and Ecuador's motives are suspect. And it's opinion piece that says if Ecuador granted asylum where Assange has no reasonable fear of imminent political persecution, it would be an abuse of the institution of asylum. And finally, the headline in the International Herald Tribune, WikiLeaks founder looks to uh, Ecuador for legal refuge. And the paper reflects on what's at stake for uh, Ecuador's President Rafael Correa and saying the asylum request could help Mr. Correa polish his reputation as a defiant provocateur in the relationship between developing Latin American nations and the United States. And of course, you can read all those articles in full at our Facebook page here on World One. We want to take you back now to our top story, and we have re-established uh, communication with Peter Hughes. He joins us on the phone now. Uh, he was badly wounded by one of those bombs in Bali. He spent two and a half weeks on life support after suffering uh, burns uh, and even lapsing into a coma and also dying almost three times. Now, Hughes gave evidence at um, Umar Patek's trial five weeks ago. Uh, again, he joins us now on the phone from Perth in Western Australia. Peter, can you hear me? Yeah, no, I can hear you. Okay, we do apologize for that interruption earlier on. You were describing for us how important uh, this moment, uh, once we get this verdict there, uh, how important this moment is for you and for others who were caught in this dreadful, dreadful time. Uh, no, it's very important. I think that um, we're all looking for closure and this is part of the process. So Thank you very much for your time and we're glad to see that you are doing, you're doing well. Peter Hughes there in uh, Perth in Western Australia. You are watching World One live from well, London. Just as the people of Egypt were expecting to find out who would be their next leader, election officials have delayed releasing the result of the presidential runoff vote. 
And that means Egypt's military rulers remain in control for now, a week after they dissolved the freely elected parliament. People have been packing Tahrir Square in Cairo to push for the military to give up power. Thousands remained in the square early Thursday. That's where we take you to uh, CNN's senior international correspondent, Ben Wiedemann. Ben, what's going on? Well, Manita, we were expecting today was the day when the Presidential Election Commission was supposed to announce the winner Thank of Thank you, Ben Wiedemann there in Cairo. You are watching World One live from London. If you thought your job was tough, spare a moment for this man. Welcome back. The new government of Greece will be sworn in today, ending months of uncertainty for now at least, but the three-party coalition already has its work cut out. It says it will try to renegotiate the terms imposed on Greece as a condition of its financial bailout. As Matthew Chance reports, that could be easier said than done. The coalition parties, the, the New Democracy, the PASOK, the Socialists, and the much smaller... Uh, Matthew Chance reporting there. Greece won't be far from the minds of participants at the annual economic forum in the Russian city of St. Petersburg. This year, it is focusing on effective leadership. And Russian President Vladimir Putin will be giving the keynote speech. For more on what we can expect to come out of this meeting, let's go straight to CNN's uh, uh, Emerging Markets Editor, John Defteris. He joins us now live from St. Petersburg. John, let's first talk about Greece. Obviously, it's the focal point. It is what everyone is talking about wherever financial, uh, uh, financial ministers and financial people are meeting. How is, the, how is it being played out where you are? Well, there was a sense of relief that uh, Greece could form a government. In fact, uh, one deputy prime minister here uh, suggested because of my uh, Greek life. All right, we look forward to that, John. Thank you so much. John Defteris there in St. Petersburg. Well, You're Brazil welcome. is home to some of the most uh, stunning natural beauty on the planet, so it is perhaps fitting that it is the venue for a major international summit this one on the environment. Delegates from 191 countries gathered on Wednesday for the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit. If all goes well, British media are reporting the U.S. and Britain believe now is the right time to attempt to negotiate a plan that would end the crisis in Syria. The measure would involve a transitional process that would include offering immunity to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. A former U.S. soldier is witnessing a side of the Syrian conflict that most of us don't get to see. He's working at a hospital in northern Lebanon that treats wounded Syrians. He spoke to CNN's Arwa Damon about his new mission, something he calls a game changer. 24-year-old Peter Kasich is hardly who you would expect to find within these walls. Politicians in Uganda are pushing to ban at least 38 groups they say promote gay rights. Homosexuality is illegal in Uganda. On Monday, the country's ethics and integrity minister ordered police to break up a gay rights workshop near the capital, Kampala. And there is legislation in the works that could bring harsh penalties for gays. David McKenzie has been monitoring the story from neighboring Kenya. He joins us now from Nairobi with the latest on that. David. Well, that's right, but, uh, David, the thank minister. you very much for that. David uh, McKenzie reporting to us. There, well, I just want to broaden out what David was talking about, the fact that Uganda is not an isolated case. There are 80 countries with laws on the books against homosexuality. Just to give you an idea here on the map, uh, map Amnesty International says there are seven countries where same-sex relations are punishable with the death penalty, shown here in yellow. They include Iran, Mauritania, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Yemen, and parts of Nigeria. You are watching World One. We'll be right back. For the eight surviving teams at Euro 2012, there's no room for error as the quarterfinals kick off. The tournament is a straight knockout contest now. And Alex Thomas is here with all the details. That's Drama. That's right, Manita. Either Portugal or the Czech Republic will be the first nation. Yeah. Doing my best there, my friend. Doing my best. You know, someone's got to try. <laughs> Alex, thank you very much. You're watching World One live from London. Coming up, we'll uh, check in with Mari Ramos, who also does her best at the oh. World with a Century. <laughs> Always trying Let's here take a to look do at uh, what's trending on social media right now. At number three, Royal Ascot and this horse. Black Caviar, the world's most popular racehorse, has arrived for arguably the world's most recognizable race uh, meeting. Black Caviar has uh, made the long journey from Australia where she has a record of 21 wins in 21 races. She even has her own Facebook page, a Twitter account, and even a blog. 
At number two, it has been a big week for Microsoft. First, it announced a tablet computer called the Surface. Now, meet the Windows 8 phone. And that's got plenty of you talking. The new phone will have updated features like memory card support and a revamped Internet Explorer. And at number one, one of the top Google searches, summer solstice, the time of year when the Northern Hemisphere rings in the summer season. It was overcast and cloudy at Stonehenge here in Britain, but that didn't stop uh, people coming out to celebrate. Well, there were all kinds of summer solstice celebrations. Meteorologist Mari Ramos is at the CNN World Weather Center with more on that. Say that five times really fast. Ah. Summer solstice celebrations. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh what you, what you showed there with the summer solstice in Stonehenge, yeah, there were thousands of people that were out there, uh, you know, worshiping the sun. And the start uh, of uh, winter, uh, of summer, I should say, for us in Could the northern. Strong. Watch out. Back to you. All right, Mari, thank you very much for that. You'd think all that sun worshiping here at Stonehenge would have helped. It's pouring outside. <laughs> but, oh, well, appreciate that anyway. Mari, thank you very much. You're watching World One Live from London. I'm Monita Rajpal. Thank you for joining us here on CNN.